Jamie Anderson is our next guest. He's a professor of strategic management at uh, the Antwerp Management School and at L'Orange Business Institute in Zurich, if I say that correctly. And the Financial Times calls him a management guru. So we're in good company here. Um, I looked at one of his, well, the TED Talk uh, you told me all about, and in that TED Talk he... Okay. <laughs> Here's Jamie Anderson. Thank you. How's your energy, you guys? Because you've been, you've been sitting here for like an hour and about 15 minutes now, I think. So here's what I'm going to suggest. Um, what I'm actually going to talk about, I mean, I, thank you very much for the introduction. There's a little bit. You, you didn't mention something very important, actually, which is my nationality. <laughs> the, the, can you guess? You guessed, you guessed, how did you know that? Did you, yeah. you heard my accent, right? Yeah. No, because I've, I've been living, I was living in Germany for five years before coming to Belgium, and I'm married to a Flemish lady, so now I'm being accused of sounding South African, <laughs> which is very bad, you know, but anyway, okay, that's very nice. No, um, but no, it's very, very nice to be here. Um, what I would like to do, actually, I'm gonna talk a little bit, because my background is in strategy, and it's in innovation management, um, and I've spent most of, actually, quite a bit of the last 10 years studying about how to build a brand in the creative industries, okay? Um, not fashion, though. Uh, so I've done a lot of stuff on the contemporary art market with people like Damien Hurst and Jeff Koons and so on. Um, so I'm going to talk, that's going to be my topic, okay? The fine art of success. How do you build a creative brand? And then what we're going to do from that, I think, is try to make some connections with fashion. How does that sound? Are you excited? Eyebrows are up, that's good. Now here's what I'm going to ask you to do, because you've been sitting for a while. So my suggestion is what I would ask you to do now, is please stand up, just in a second, and then turn around to the people behind you. And what I would like you to do is discuss with them for a couple of minutes who have been the most successful creative brands in the last three years. Okay, that's, now by the way, there's another reason for this. Huh? Some of you are probably busting to go to the toilet. You've been sitting, yeah? So now is your chance, while the others are talking, to escape to the bathroom, and we'll start in about four or five minutes. Okay, so please stand up, turn around. Most successful creative brands of the last three years. Okay, now before that, we, we, are, we are talking about branding, and we're going to be talking about personal branding. So, what do you, because it was very nice, the, the, the management guru, guru thing. Okay, it was nice you mentioned that. But what do you actually call an Australian management guru? Because I was this morning in Amsterdam with some marketeers at a big conference in Amsterdam, and a guy came up to you during the coffee break, and he says, I've got a new brand title for you as a professor. The Kanguru. Okay, I thought it was funny. Okay, very good. I'm trying. All right, so big brands, obviously not me, but who, who, who are most successful creative brands for the last three years? Ah, uh, we got into intellectual discussion of what is success. All right, I will, I will use the capitalistic business school interpretation. Ah, uh, it's about visibility, brand equity, money income generation. New customers. Very good. Okay. But which names came up? 
Okay, and I should have I should have put those parameters because you say intellectually in the community who's the most no I'm talking about hard cash. Yeah. All right. Who's the most successful? Who's the most successful? Lady Gaga. I mean, it's, it's without a question, okay? And it, it, no matter where I ask this in the world today, if you ask about creative brands, people will say Lady Gaga. And in fact, what I want to do is talk about her, right? Because I'm going to suggest that actually her success in the last three years offers a lot of lessons uh, for any person in a creative industry in the terms of how to build a brand. Now, not how to build a brand in terms of how the old world worked, but how to build a brand in terms of the new world working. And I think this is some of the things we heard talk, you know, from Sarah and from Bruno. We're talking a lot about the new world of fashion. What I've actually experienced in my limited engagement with fashion is that you're in a, in, like an inflection point, huh? going from an old world to a new world. Huh? If you went to a fashion week five years ago, who would have been in the front row of the fashion week? The editors. Who's in the front row of the fashion week now? It's bloggers, huh? It's changing. Huh? The world is changing. Okay, let's talk about it. Okay. So we're going to talk, and in fact, why, why Lady, okay, we choose Lady Gaga, we choose Lady Gaga, but in fact, what I'm going to suggest is that marketeer, you know, creative people have been brilliant brand builders throughout history. Yeah? So if we look back, you know, I mean, 16th century Venice, this guy is Tintoretto, who disrupted the Venetian art market, he created a brand, huh? he built a reputation. Last week on Monday, I was at the Tate Modern in the UK, and I took a group of my students to see the Damien Hirst retrospective. Huh? Is he an artist or is he a brand? He's both. Huh? He's both. And he's a business person, by the way. Jeff Koons, huh? also a huh? very successful contemporary artist. He's a brand. He's a business person. Rubens, we're, we're in the home of Rubens. Has anyone been to the, at the Rubens house? He was not just an artist. He wasn't just a creative person. He knew how to go to market. Huh? And I think this is very interesting what we're hearing from, from Sarah. She's saying it's not just about creativity. It's about much more than that, all right? And I think this lady demonstrates all of those things, okay? So let's talk about her a little bit. Um, where does she come from? Okay, let's have a, have a look at her. I'm a little bit unclear. Here she is, little Stephanie Germanotta, born in 1984 on the Upper West Side of New York. What does that make her, by the way? Who, who he was born after 1984? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Who was born after 1984? Just one person. You're special. You're not like us. I'm an old guy. I was born in 71. Can you believe it? Okay. Now, that makes you, that makes you millennials, huh? Because you came of age 16 years old in 2000. Huh? You're the generation Y or millennials. So is she, huh? You think different, huh? Now, we'll come to that in a moment. But what was her goal in life, huh? In fact, she's talked about from the time she was four years old, she wanted to be a superstar. And she loved to dance and she loved to dress up and everything else. She came from a very wealthy family. Huh? Her parents, her dad was a, an, an internet entrepreneur involved with the early startup of PayPal. Her mum was a telecoms executive. And what did they say to her? Huh? It's not just about money in life and not just about fame. If you ever get into a position where you are famous, you also need a purpose. Huh? Not just make money, but make a difference. Her parents were very, very active in terms of, of charitable works and, and giving. She went to school. Do you know this? She went to school with the Hilton sisters. Do you know the Hilton? Do you know Paris Hilton? She was a classmate of Paris Hilton's. And she also went to a very expensive private girls' school where also they got this message drummed into them in a way. Huh? Money is one ambition in life, but meaning is another. And she's talked about that a lot. Huh? She started playing piano. Now, here she is. By the time she's 16 years old. Oh, by the way, when she, by the time she was 13, she wrote her first piano ballad. Huh? By the time she was 16, she was playing the New York club circuit in the Stephanie Germanotta band. She was a straight-A student at school, and she got early admission to the Tisch School in New York. You know the Tisch School? Very famous art school. Huh? She went into the music department because she's always dreamed of becoming a superstar musician. Huh? When she got there, she was a little bit disappointed huh? because she'd been a classically trained pianist so taking vocal lessons from the age of four. First year music for her at university was boring. She knew it all. So what did she do? She actually took electives from the art school. Huh? And guess who she studied? She went to art history classes, and she studied Picasso. And you know, the folks I showed you on the picture, Warhol, Damien Hirst. And she said, what I started to get interested in was, these people were obviously creative, but were they so much more creative than other artists of their time? No. 
what she started to understand is they understood what she calls the art of fame. Uh, and, she, and in her second year, she wrote her dissertation on Damien Hirst, the British shock artist. Huh? Now, at the same time, she was, of course, wanting, continuing to build her music career while she was at university. Um, but she also understood that as a creative person, as a musical talent, you can't do it alone. I think we heard this a little bit already th today. So what she did was start to understand who were, the, who were the movers and shakers in the music industry. Now, she was living in New York, and she met a guy, and in fact, she did uh, some work experience with a guy called Rob Fusari. You heard of this guy? He's a producer for Destiny's Child, Beyonce. He's worked with Nelly Furtado. She did work experience with him while she was still at high school. And then while she was at university, she fell into a relationship with him. He was 38 years old, she was 18, and they, went, they started dating each other. Do you know any other famous women who... I wouldn't say that. I didn't say that. How did Madonna learn about how to make movies? Who was her first husband? Do you remember? Because she came from the music world, the dance world. She needed to know how to make music videos. Huh? So, relationship, anyway. But, you know, well, imagine, so she starts, okay, they start a relationship, and he sees this incredible music t musical talent, but what's missing? Look at her, folks. What's, what's missing from this girl? A, a look, yeah? What, what's special, huh? Because Rob Fusari says to her, look, you're incredibly talented, but there are lots of girls like you. What's your brand? And, in fact, she comes into the studio every morning, you know, writing with Rob and producing music, and she sings Radio Gaga every morning. And his romantic name for her was My Lady Gaga, which became her, her, her stage name. Eh? And in fact, she then left Stephanie Germanotta behind. Now, Rob said, you also need to learn something else. Eh? You need to learn how to move. You need to learn how to look. Eh? So he introduced her to this lady. This is Lady Starlight, a, a neo-burlesque DJ performer, also from New York. They started collaborating together. They weren't jealous of each other, you know, because Stephanie knew how to write. She knew how to compose. This lady knew how to move. They collaborated with each other. They weren't competing. They were helping each other to be successful. They started touring together. Now, if you're a millennial, if you're born after 1984, and you're on tour, traveling around the States, eh, how do you keep in touch with your family back home? You send them emails? Do you call them on the telephone? Come on, this is ancient technology. Eh? What do you do? Come on. It's God, come on. You have, you, well, initially, she was on MySpace. This is what millennials, this is what kids do. They communicate with their family and their friends while they're away from home on MySpace. Of course, that became Facebook. And also something interesting here, which this girl didn't understand at the time. What's the difference between the professional Stephanie, the Lady Gaga brand, and the personal Lady Gaga brand on Facebook? What's the difference? Because you know what, in the fashion industry, we've, we've seen a lot of this, huh? There's kind of a professional projection of the person, and then there's the real person. Can you get away with that in today's world? No. no. But she didn't know any other way. Huh? So for her, Lady Gaga is who I am, and that's how she was on Facebook. So she wasn't just talking to her friends, she was talking to her parents, but she was also talking to her fans, all in the same dialogue, not separated. Huh? Now, there's a big problem here, though, huh? because in the traditional world of music, in the old world of music, how do you launch a debut artist? Remember the old world? CDs, big record labels. There was a, a validation process. By the way, there was a validation process in the contemporary art market. In fashion, there was an old way to get validated, I guess, as a debut fashion designer, a young fashion designer. Those things don't work anymore, the old ways. Huh? Now, what was the old way? In, in the old way of the music industry, you started playing the club circuit, and then you got spotted by a record label. They would try to lock you into a 10-year deal. Then what they would do is try to get you on local radio right, to build the following to people come along to your local band shows. Then they would try to get you national radio coverage. If you started to get a following on national radio, where do you go next? No, you're young. The internet didn't exist until 2002, right? three for most of us. Where did you go? TV. Where on TV? MTV. Okay? That was a stepping stone. When you got MTV, you got national coverage, then you got international coverage, and then you did the big concerts. Huh? How long did that process take? Seven years, roughly. That was the business model. Now, okay, this is, this is the million dollar question. Huh? There's a copy of my book for anybody who can get the right answer to this one. Huh? I'll sign it and everything. 
All right, here's the question. Why does that no longer work in a world of digital? Because guess what, radio, do kids listen to radio? Nope. Has anyone watched MTV lately? What's on MTV now? There's no music in it, it's reality TV. There's a show on there called Real Life with Paris Hilton. Has anyone seen that? It's not real life. <laughs> it's really not. No, but you see, what's the thing? Because the problem is kids don't listen to the radio, they don't w watch MTV, where do they consume music? YouTube. Oh, okay, that, that's half, you've got half the book, eh? First three chapters. Now, now, what's the problem of launching a debut artist on YouTube? No, that's not a problem, eh? It's, it doesn't cost you anything. It's very... Not what's the problem of a debut artist who goes onto YouTube and says, come and find me? No, come and come cheap joy. No, you got lots of reach. No, come on, think, think about it. Because if you go on YouTube and I'm Lady Gaga, here I am, come and get me. What's the problem? Nobody knows who the fuck you are. So who's going to search for you? The problem is search. Yeah? Because who do people search for on YouTube? They search for people they know. When I was in Holland this morning, there was a girl in Holland called Esme Denters. You heard of her? She became famous. huh? Now, why did she become famous? Because she went onto YouTube and started singing Beyonce covers. She's quite good looking. She's got a good voice. She was on YouTube before Beyonce was. So everyone went onto YouTube searching for Beyonce, but the record label said, we don't give things away for free. This is five years ago. Eh? So we don't put our Beyonce on YouTube because you have to pay. Eh? So this girl became famous. Eh? So the problem is search. This is a, this is a big issue. Eh? So how do you do, deal with that? Rob Fusari didn't know. You know why? Because Rob Fusari, he's a creative guy. He's the writer. He's the person you need to work with. To, to write songs and produce songs. He's not a business person. He's not a distribution expert, but he had a friend. And he introduced Lady Gaga to this guy. You very rarely see pictures of these two. This guy is a guy called Vincent Herbert. He's the, he's the manager of a CEO of a company called um, Interscope. And he left the traditional music industry because he said it's broken. Huh? These guys don't get it anymore. Streamline is his label, which is the, the, the music label of Interscope, which is his, his record company. And he said, we have to try a different way. Now, the first thing he said, I need an incredible talent. Huh? Lady Gaga walked into his office in Los Angeles. Rob Fusari set up the interview. She walked in. What was she wearing? No, come on. She was wearing knee-high leather boots, fishnet stockings, a thong, a peekaboo bra with tassels off her nipples. You know, he said, that's different. And then she sat down at the piano and started to play, and he was blown away. He said, here she is, my superstar. Now, he then, because he's been toying with ideas. So they started working on, of course, you have to have a product. Eh? They started working on the CD, which was the first one. And then he said, you need to talk to my friend Troy. Because Vincent Herbert had been brainstorming, thinking about how do we overcome this issue of visibility. He's been working with a guy, and this guy is a genius. Eh? This is Troy Carter. He's one of the world's... He's incredible. He's a marketeer. He's a social media marketeer. And he'd been working on understanding how do you actually build a brand in a digital world, in a social media world. And he said, look, here's what we do. Number one, we have to get, continue getting her visibility. So they plan to, for her to go on tour with a guy called Kane West. You know him? Yeah? Okay. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to start mapping out the blogosphere. Who are the most influential bloggers in the music industry in Japan, in Germany, in the UK, in the US, our target markets? And we're going to target those bloggers and we're going to shoot Gaga to them because huh? she's special. And we're going to give them privileged access, preferential treatment, interviews. Huh? They started doing that. Now, the disaster was that they'd booked all of these venues for the Kane West tour. And about a month before, well, two months before the launch of the Kane West tour, he went a bit crazy. Do you remember? Kane West jumped up on the stage at the MTV Music Awards because his friend Beyonce didn't get the best female performer, a young American country girl. He ripped the award out of her hand. He went, he went crazy. And he couldn't, he couldn't go ahead with the concerts. It was a PR disaster. So these guys had a choice. Huh? What do we do? Do we cancel this concert? We've spent millions on booking venues and all that kind of stuff. Or do we go ahead with her as a debut artist that nobody knows? 
Mm. Did you say do it? There's big risk, eh? There's big, there was big debates, huh? What do we do? This is millions at risk here. Eh? What they did was this guy, he put six full-time social media marketeers on Gaga. Invested. And what did they do, huh? They went crazy. They targeted these people. They started to build a followership for her. Now, how did they do that? Number one, those 50 bloggers that they identified generated 15 million page impressions in a matter of six weeks. 15 million, huh? Those 15 million page impressions translated then to YouTube hits, and this is where her, if you go on, look at the Google analytics on her. Huh? In 2009, 2010, suddenly pff, it went up. This is the bloggers. Huh? Now what they then did was they discovered there was this new, new technology in the world that's come along just at the right time. It's called Twitter. Who is here on, who's on Twitter? Here, yeah? Isn't it incredible, huh? Because it's now. And I, I'm, a, I'm a Lady Gaga Twitter follower. Huh? I'm one of the 30 million. 30 million, huh? And I get a personal message from her three or four times a day. And you know what I know? It's from her, and it's right now. And guess, who is Lady Gaga on Twitter? Who is she? No, it's not. Make no mistake, I, I've, I, I've written a case study on this lady. We do. What happens, think about it, what happens if Generation Y discovers that Lady Gaga's Twitter is being written by somebody else? You're dead, unfollow her. Huh? But this is interesting, because this is the reaction of old pe older people. Oh, it can't be her writing those Twitters because she's a busy business person. How fuck me? How long does it take to write it? I'm on Twitter. Eh? Of course. How long does it take me to write my Twitter message each day? Seconds. You, I don't care who you are. Everybody's got time for Twitter. But what's brilliant about this girl is it just comes natural for her. And what does she talk about? She talks about her music, but she also talks on Mother's Day. She got millions of Mother's Day messages from these people, huh? I'll talk about that in a second. But she was also tweeting to her mum, saying, thanks, mum. You see? Now, this is fundamental, because in the old world of branding and the old world of launching this brand, there was a lot of fake, eh? a lot of bullshit. This is the meaning of the brand, and it was massage, and it was... It doesn't work anymore. I had dinner last night with the chief marketing officer of Nike for Europe. I sat with the chief marketing officer from Greenpeace, and they said, you know, you can't lie anymore. This separation between... no." So what's the core elements of what Gar I think she has this deep understanding. Huh? Troy Carter understands it. Number one, a brand in this digital age of social media has to be authentic. Huh? If there's a gap between who you really are and who you say you are, they're going to find out. If they find out, they unfollow you. Huh? Secondly, in this age of social media and digital media, it's not about me. Huh? In the old world of, you know, I don't care which we talk about brands, fashion or fast-moving consumer goods, branding was something we did to people, huh? We project our brand to them. These people, they want to participate. Eh? In this world, branding is something you do with people. It's a conversation. It's a dialogue. Eh? You join together with people. And the third thing you have to do for people like this is excite them about the future. Because if you haven't got something exciting to say about what's coming next, they unfollow you. You're not interesting. Yeah? So she's understood that, and they've done it. Eh? So of course, they've leveraged Twitter. She has her own website, Gaga Vision, where she look, puts out all of her new content. Uh, and it's also not just Gaga's music, it's her in the studio every day. It's complete access. Huh? She has cameras following her. This is, this is, this is what the Generation Y, which is always connected. That's what she says, I'm always connected. And I'm always communicating with my fans. Now, you couldn't do this 10 years ago, because if you wanted to have these deep relationships with your, con with your followers, with, with your fans, you could only do it with a few of them. Huh? An event like this. If you wanted to reach lots and lots of millions of people, H&M, you know, the big above the line stuff, you can only have shallow conversations. With this new technology, you can have the deep conversations with millions of people. We couldn't do that before. Huh? Now, the second part of this is very interesting. Huh? Because if you watch, who, who is watch, who's a fan of Gaga? And you watch a paparazzi or you watch a... Okay, come on, hand up. Who, you know the paparazzi clip? Yes? What's weird about the paparazzi clip? Because you start it, and Gaga's in bed with a Swedish actor, and they're kissing, kind of making love, and there's diamonds everywhere, and it's Gaga's the big star. This was also part of a very important element. Huh? She was projected as a superstar from day one. What happens? This music video goes on for two minutes, and there's no music. 
Now, hang on a second. This is weird, huh? Because this is not the way we've done this in the past. In the past, a song has to be four minutes long. Three and a half minutes if it's on TV, huh? Why? In fact, for 50 years, nobody questioned this. That a music clip, well, sorry, Michael Jackson did it. He did it. It didn't work out, huh? It got rejected by the radio stations and by MTV. Now, can anyone tell me, okay, why for 50 years did we all understand that it had to be four minutes? That was the rule. Why? No, it's not TV. No. Yes, sorry, thank you. Say it again. Do you hear that? You probably don't know what this is, huh? When I was a kid, we had these devices. They were made of black plastic. Huh? They had grooves on them, and you put them on this machine, and it went around and around. You put a needle, and you got music from it. Really? I'm not kidding. Huh? And this thing, the problem was that the technology, you could only fit four minutes worth of grooves, so that became the standard. And guess what? Nobody questioned it for 50 years. Just like nobody in the contemporary art market said, well, you know, because in the art market for 50 years, art had to be a sculpture, or a painting, it had to go on the floor on the wall. Damien Hirst comes along and says, well, why can't art be dissected animals? You see? He also questioned. And I wonder, there's so many creative industries where we all claim to be creative, creative, creative. Yeah, creative at making that stuff. But creative about rethinking the business model? No. Eh? Some of us are doing it, but very few. Eh? Most of us are stuck in the old world. Now, here's the thing. What, what then should be, oh sorry, I should mention this, huh? so that debut tour, 227 million dollars in revenue. Now Madonna's hard, can, uh, sorry, her hard candy tour, which happened a year before, 186, 186, this is 227, and 2.5 million people attended Gaga concerts as a debut artist. This is historical, huh? it's never been done before. Now, the other thing here is I talked about the length of the clip. So if we're not stuck now to the vinyl record, and by the way, that became the standard because the radio station is like three and a half minutes so they can put lots of ads in. But what about if the paradigm changes and it's not the radio station or MTV who determines how long the clip is, it's you. Because it's you, eh? And what, what determines it then? How long should the ideal music clip be now in this world of digital distribution? Yes. Yes. And what is that? <laughs> it depends, huh? You see, for guys, you know what happens, you know what, you know, see, I move a lot, huh? You have to do that for guys, huh? Because after seven and a half minutes, and by the way, this is the human attention span. It's roughly seven and a half minutes. If you don't do something, like me move over there, or move over here, or tell a joke, or ask you a question, roughly every seven minutes, guys start thinking about sex. Really? Yes. I'm a professor, you can take it from me, and I can also speak from personal experience, all right? We start thinking about sex. It's natural, isn't it? It's evolutionary. What about women? Oh, sorry, what about women? What do women start thinking about? In this room? Yes. <laughs> it's incredible. You can just think about that. And you know what's even incredible? You, and this is incredible. And by the way, this research has been done on lab rats, huh? On lab rats, huh? It's this, and, and this, if lab rats, you don't give them food for a few days, and then you put a lady rat in with a man rat, they start having sex, eh? Then you, you put some food in the cage. The lady will stop, huh? She will go to the food. What about the guy? He don't stop. <laughs> there you go. Now, you see, this is a big problem, huh? Like for me, in my, in my business, this is a big problem. Because what, you know? Because evolution only gave guys enough blood to either run a brain or a penis, not both at the same time. So if, if, if this is important, because if I lose their attention, that's the end of it, right? And then they, I lose them and come back again, okay? So guess what? Lady Gaga's video clips on average are seven minutes and 47 seconds long. Smart, huh? But did she discover this? No. In fact, she discovered this through a partner, a friend, who she admired for years, huh? She's been following a guy called Jonas Ackerlund. He's the producer of Paparazzi, huh? He's a director, huh? Jonas Ackerlund, in fact, I've got a picture of him here. This guy, Swedish. Sorry, I had to stretch his face a little bit for the screen, huh? all right? Um, he is a Swedish mu music video director, but he was an ex-heavy metal drummer, well-connected in the heavy metal scene, 
and he was a psychology graduate. Oh, he remembered a paper he read about human attention span. Then he started thinking about YouTube. So he went to a bunch of his friends. Has anyone heard of a band called Rammstein? Yes, raise your hand if you know who Rammstein is. If you don't know who Rammstein is. Okay, they're kind of like a cute German folk band. You know, they're, they're a cute bunch of guys. They dress up in traditional German costume, you know, later ho. No, no. They're like, they're like a, a really heavy German version of ACDC. Okay, you know who ACDC is? Very good. Okay, now, so he's working with Rammstein. And you know Rammstein's pushing boundaries, huh? And he works with Rammstein and he produces a video clip called Pussy. Who's seen Pussy? It's not about the band member's cat. It's about se It's a porno! They produce a seven and a half minute porno movie with the band members. Can I use bad language? Because I'm Australian. It kind of rolls off the tongue like that. They're fucking blow everything and complete explicit. Oh. You know, I had to watch this for research purposes, as you understand. Okay? No, but also, by the way, it's not any kind of porn, it's German porn. Has anyone watched German porn? Raise your hand. No, come on. I, I lived in Germany for five years, a eh? lot of late nights, staying at hotels in Frankfurt. And you, you flick through the channels and you can only watch this stuff for a little while. Eh? It, it's pretty hardcore, isn't it? Some people are saying, mm, it's okay. I asked this, this is very Belgian. Yes, but this is very Belgian because I asked this question in Amsterdam this morning, has anyone seen German born? And 60% of the audience hands went up immediately. They're not shy, huh? Okay, but that's it. Anyway, um, sorry, just as a small distraction. Do you realize that they dub German porn? Do you know what I mean by dubbing? Not undertitles, voiceover. <laughs> Could you imagine if that was your job? You come home at night and the kids say, how was your day today, mum? And you say, well, I got to make all the noise but not have any fun. It'd be terrible, okay? So she works with this guy, he understands it. She says he's a brilliant, she approaches him and says, can you work with me? And he starts working with her on these concepts, okay? now. There's another element here, huh? because if you've got to stay, oh, by the way, on YouTube, do you see that number? That's, I ch last night, I went on YouTube, this is how many music tracks she has given away for free on YouTube. I can't even say that number. That's billions. Okay, now this is also interesting, huh? because in a lot of industries, which we say we don't give anything away, huh? no, 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 we want to sell, sell, sell. She does sell, but what's the conversion rate? Well, let's have a look at this, because she's, she gives away 2.1 billion, she sells 23 million, that's 23 million albums, and she sells 66 million singles. Now, you should also see that there's a, an amazing correlation here. Eh? What's the correlation? What's the correlation? How many Facebook friends does she have, folks? About 30 million. On average, they buy one album each. Twitter followers, 27 million. On average, they buy three singles each. Now, this is extremely important, because huh? you are not, you know, we always thought we're a brand. No, in today's world, you can't just be a brand. You have to have a purpose, huh? And you have to ask, why do these people follow her? Number one, she's authentic, huh? she's real, and they feel that they're her friend. Now, a lot of older generation people say, this is ridiculous. How does, how does someone who's one of 26 million feel like her friend? You don't understand the mindset of Generation Y. The average Generation Y person has 180 Facebook friends. They have a different concept of friendship. Eh? Yeah? Now, the other thing, of course, so one of the things is you don't steal from your friends. Eh? So she leverages that. Eh? Now, the other thing, of course, is it's immediacy. Because what does she say, folks? On Twitter, she says, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. My new single is coming, and I've just finished working on the first, the, the video clip with Akralund. And in fact, she gives preferential access to just a short from the clip before any of the other media, right? goes to her friends first. And then she says, it's coming tomorrow. And then she says, that it's, it's coming in two hours. And then she says, now. It's available on iTunes. And what happens is her sales go like this, whoop, and then whoop. Because Generation Y, they don't just want intimacy, they don't just want relationships, they want immediacy. Yeah? So this is what I call, and I got, this is why I got this guru title last year from the Financial Times, I say this is about garganomics. It's relationship, which is trust-based, authentic. It's intimacy and it's immediacy. We can do that today. We could not do this as a fashion designer 10 years ago. No way. You can do it today. Eh? So 
you also see this, she changes her look about every five or six weeks. Now, why does she change her look about every five or six weeks? Because she has to stay current. Because the kids are impatient, right? They want something new. So not only does she change her look, she also does something scandalous or funny or different. Huh? Do you know she became the godmother of Elton John's child? The concept in itself is kind of weird, right? But she did it and got a lot of publicity. She had, at the Venice Biennale, she had breakfast with Tarantino talking about a movie that generated a lot of interest. Yeah? But think about it. She also has to stay cool in terms of fashion. How does she do that? How do you do that? Do you think she knows every fashion trend that's going on? Yes. Did you hear that? One of her good friends is this guy. You know him? Yes. Yeah. And he is part. Now, remember we said at the Tisch School she studied art history? One of the people she admired was Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol had what he called the factory, which he surrounded himself with a group of really smart people, marketing people from the business world, finance people, investment, all kinds of people, and they influenced and helped him along. She has created what she calls the House of Gaga. And I've shown you just a few of the people which are part of that house. Are they locked into her? No, they're locked onto her. They really want to help her because guess what? It also helps them. And they, see, they believe in her. They believe in her purpose. Because what else is she talking about? She's not just talking about fashion and all that stuff. She's talking about the fact she was bullied as a teenager. And she was. Eh? We, we know this. Eh? She doesn't want other kids to be bullied. She talks about gay and lesbian rights. It's not cool to be homophobic. Eh? So she talks about things that matter. And she, people want to go along with her eh? on that journey. This is beyond money, eh? There's a wonderful interview with her on 60 Minutes, the yeah, US program. If you're cynical, you watch it and say, yeah, right. But at one point of the interview, Anderson Cooper says, what do you want to achieve? And she says, I don't want to just make money. I want to make a difference. And she's serious. She talks about that every day. Last year, she had a distribution deal with Target. Remember Born This Way album released last year? She found out through her Facebook page, her gay followers on Facebook, that, that, that Target, the retail chain, was giving money to a Republican candidate who was opposing gay marriage. She immediately dropped the distribution deal. It cost her millions, huh? It was two weeks before the launch of the album. She had to find a new distributor. But that was more important to her than money. Now, by the way, what else has this guy helped her to do? He's also helped her to make the transition to this world, huh? the world of the print media. Because not only is he the creative director of Mugler, he's also the editor of Vogue Home Japan. He understands the print media world. Huh? So he's helped her bridge. So, what's the lessons? Huh? Number one, young fashion designers. Yeah, great. My, my belief from the creative industries is have a purpose. Huh? It's not just about making money or building your brand. What's your purpose? It was, interesting. it was fantastic to hear what you were talking about in terms of sustainability. Eh? That's a purpose. It's not, it's, not a, it's not an objective to build a brand and sell more stuff. It's a purpose. And you've moved beyond you know, vision or brand to purpose. That, and that's where we have to go, I think. The second thing to understand is you really have to have a deep understanding of how customers are thinking, how they're consuming, how they're getting information. You have to have an understanding of how the industry works. Eh? Young fashion designers, creativity is not enough, and I think you're absolutely right. From the little I know about the fashion industry is the schools, huh? the fashion schools, they're doing a great disservice huh? because they're telling young designers that creativity is all it takes. No way. It takes much more than creativity. Huh? By the way, the art schools are guilty of that too. All right? So second thing is you've got to understand how the industry works. How does the process of validation work, whether you're a contemporary artist or a fashion designer? I'm sure it's the same, huh? You've got to make the stepping stones. The, the third thing is you can't do it alone. Eh? Look at the most successful fashion designers in the world today, and I bet you they have a business partner. Damien Hurst, his business partner, Saatchi. One of the top brand marketeers in the world. Eh? And we see this with a lot of creative people. There's always a business partner behind them. And in, in, in many cases, many partners. Eh? Because you have strengths, you have creative strengths, but you've also got a lot of weaknesses. And if you can't compensate for those weaknesses, you're never going to make it. Now, the fourth thing is incredible. Yeah? It's hard work, isn't it? With all of you who see young fashion designers, it's hard work and it takes time. The problem is most of them run out of money before the hard work pays off. And this is where the business partner comes in. Now, finally, it's also about renewing yourself huh? Because the problem is we see a lot of fashion designers also, I'm sure, you see it in the, in the art world, you have a big launch, a couple of successes, and you're unable to sustain it over time. 
Look at how many fashion designers in the last 24 months have dropped out, I've read just from my reading the press. Huh? It's tough, okay? So, okay, I don't know a lot about fashion, but I would suggest that these fundamental principles, five things that I talked about, are the same. What I'd like to hear from you is do you agree? Do you disagree? What questions do you have? But the last thing is, as a young designer, you have to ask yourself, what is my gaga strategy?